welcome. I'm Lee Peterson. I'm the host of the podcast WDCast, which is called WDCast because it's brought to you by WD Partners, whose tagline is innovation at scale, which means they can create something with a blank piece of paper, go all the way through operations, architecture, and engineering, and make many of them. So thanks, WD. And uh, thank you, Chris, in particular. Today, we have someone with us who is on the forefront, something that's really important just overall right now, I think, human-centered design. Stephen Wirth, he is the Senior Manager of Category Experience Design for Purina, who has an extensive background in said matters, which to me, again, is key in today's marketplace. But I'll let him tell you more about that. Stephen, how are you today? I'm great, Lee. Thanks for having me. Excited to uh, to do this. Good to have you here. Thanks. All the way from Illinois, somewhere in Illinois. <laughs> 20 minutes outside of St. Louis. We can say St. Louis. We're just in, I'm in my little sleepy town in Columbia, right outside the city. Okay. So Stephen, let's, let's talk about you for a second. Please tell the listeners where you've been, what your journey is, so we can all get to know you just a little bit better. I'm one of those weird millennials that stayed at the same company for the, uh, my entire 16 plus year career. Um, I'm an industrial designer by background. So I, I actually went to school also in Illinois. I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign, oh. got a, uh, a degree in industrial design and very quickly got hired on um, at Purina in 2004 to integrate and build a structural packaging design discipline into their R&D division. So I was hired in. It's interesting, my career, um, I've had three positions in this organization, which is really one of the reasons I've stayed so long, and all of them have been new roles. So this first new role was a, was a newly created industrial design position, helping think about packaging from a form and function standpoint, designing solutions that were more ergonomic, you know, look better. It wasn't even about graphics. It was really about structural design. I did that for nine years and I actually traveled all over the world supporting Nestle. Nestle owns Purina. And so uh, Nestle is obviously a global CPG company. And I got a chance to be a part of their global R&D division, traveling all over the world, supporting design initiatives, uh, mainly packaging um, through that network. And I did that for nine years, which led to a, another unique opportunity also within Purina as, as we were working with the marketing teams and different organizational business units across the broader business, we realized that design thinking was, was really more of this business problem solving capability that was being integrated into things like brand strategy. And so they created a new role called a, a design strategist in a newly formed innovation team. that was really about new business development, internal new business development, mainly through our brands using human centered design and design thinking methods to drive, to unlock new value for consumers and ultimately even internal, internal groups as well. And I did that for two and a half years. And what that led to was really this expanded notion that, Hey, maybe we could apply design with a capital D across our business outside of just the brands. Um, so obviously as we think about brands like Beg and Strips and Purina One and other Nestle brands, obviously that's where design is primarily focused. But what we were realizing was it was really a thinking tool. It was helping people frame the right problem and, and understand you know, how, do they, how they could solve complex organizational issues in new ways. And that led to my current role, which was they wanted somebody to come lead our uh, retail innovation team that is part of our category leadership group. And our job is really you know, designing retail solutions now in an omni-channel, both digital, physical environment and experiences focused on really user engagement and the quality of that user engagement. And they wanted somebody with a design background to come lead that team and integrate a design perspective into how we can use that to shape value for our retailers and customer teams. And so I've been doing that for the better part of uh, five years. And, ha and one of the most interesting pieces of that is I have functional control over our 9,000 square foot retail innovation center. So I, we have a innovation lab at Purina, state of the art technology and innovation center. And uh, I have control and direction over that. And we use that to engage our retailer partners. So we have Walmart and Amazon and Chewy and Kroger and you, you name it, we've probably had them show up and engage with us on what the future of retail looks like and how that applies to pet shopping. You know, I've always been impressed. I've worked with a number of uh, CPG companies. And I remember one of the first times I did, I sat at a table with a, a, a bunch of people from uh, that brand. It was, it was actually a series of brands as well. And I remember towards the end of like two days where the meetings, I said, do you guys, I got to say something in all seriousness, like there's a lot of brain power in this room and a lot of really smart people in, in CPG, such as yourself. And um, I said, do you guys realize that if you weren't doing this, you could probably solve world hunger in about two months? <laughs> You know, I, I, I think the ability to do what you're doing is not really an easy thing. And 
and to have that opportunity within a company like that sounds like it was was terrific. Okay, so in in your speaking in your articles and I'm, and I'm sure in your job and you just did it right now. You talk about human centered design was also in the intro. So tell us exactly what you mean by human centered design. Yeah, I mean you if you if you google it you'll get a thousand different definitions. The way I define it in its simplest form it's an approach that uses empathy, ideation and experimentation that puts the needs of an end user or a human at the center of the problem solving process. So that's the simplest way to describe it. And so how do you involve that type of design in in the process of like well, we need to create a, a new design because, you know, in the old days, they'd go like, well, this this red looks really good. Let's put it in front of 20 people. They like the red. Let's roll it out. But now it sounds like something completely different. Yeah, that's a good point. So, I mean, while it's easy to think about human-centered design applied to a product, you know, packaging is a prime example and still a huge opportunity to apply this, this, this methodology, you know, it, it really transcends any type of problem that you need to solve. And I'll kind of break it down into its key principles and you know, think about it through the lens of packaging. We can use that as an example. If you take the three phases that I mentioned, this whole idea of empathy, ideation, and experimentation, you assemble a team and you really can build empathy two ways. You can become the end user. So I mean, how many, how often do we actually go and become somebody who's using that packaging? Actually, you know, take a sample home and use it in the context of your own environment and actually build empathy from, from what they're what they're going through. Why is this hard to open? Why doesn't this fit in my pantry? We oftentimes we assume that what people are telling us is the problem. Problem, but ultimately, some of the unmet needs are from obviously becoming and understanding it from a real first person point of view, or you can observe people. We do a lot of time graphic style research where you're in the context of the people that you're trying to serve. And you're watching them use that said packaging or that product or use a service and you observe them in their natural habitat and you can uncover patterns and behaviors and insights um, in, in that world. So it's not allowing only secondary market research or some sort of study guide the problem solving process. You're really in the context of becoming the end user. There's this eight old ad adage that framing the right problem is really the key to success. There's a, there's a famous quote from a Harvard professor that said, people don't really want a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. And so when you frame <laughs> the problem around how many ways can I deliver, it may lead you down a different path than designing just another drill with another feature. I mean, it might be something different and that's how you really unlock new value. And then from that empathy, you assemble diverse teams that are assembled to, to co-create ideas to solve for that problem. Once you have that problem framed, i.e. Is, is it a packaging insight? Maybe you realize that it's not about packaging. Maybe it's about storage. Maybe it's about an environmental design aspect. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But you assemble them and you co-create together to solve that problem using a variety of design thinking methods that really focus on the end user, but then start to begin to take the feasibility or technical needs and the viability and the business needs into account to consider that broader business ecosystem. And, and I think that's a, that's a misnomer about human-centered design is that it oftentimes doesn't consider the needs of the business or, or the technical needs to bring something to market. It absolutely does. But the core of human-centered design obviously is the, is the end user and making sure that you're serving that customer based on what their needs are and then challenging yourselves to figure that figure out a go-to-market strategy that makes the most sense for the business. And yep. then finally, you, proud, you prototype the bejesus out of it. Uh, solutions are prototyped, they're tested with, the, with, that, with that same end user to determine ways to improve the solution or the experience. It's this constant pursuit over perfection. And quite frankly, it continues as long as you need it to until you have a desirable solution where it's, it's, ne it's never a linear process. If you, if you look it up and just click the images tab in Google, there's probably a lot of different like bird's nest style drawings of what the design process looks like. And that's because it's true. Oftentimes, it's not this cyclical or linear process. You're learning along the way and, and you're using those insights and really the, those that feedback from your end user to build the right product to drive the right value. You know, I still don't think it's prevalent in, in the uh, industry because it's just one of our family's pet peeves. Uh, you know, when you try to open a cracker box, let's say, you can't. So you got to go out and you got to get the scissors and you're like, oh, I got to get the scissors and I can't open this cracker box. My, my first thought and my first question to like my kids was always, did Anybody, when they made this package, actually try to open it themselves? So I don't know that it's that prevalent. Do you, do you have any idea like how prevalent it, it is in the industry? Yeah, it, it's hard. In the spirit of empathy, I have empathy for organizations that <laughs> deal with this. Because, yeah. I mean, ultimately, think about a company like Purina. I mean, we're a multi-billion dollar organization that has built our competitive advantage on scale and volume and brands that really connect with the consumer. And if you try to uproot that and you add a feature that's 
slows down manufacturing mm-hmm. or you yeah. know that limits supply and demand, it's a major hurdle. And it's something that, you know, from an organizational standpoint is something that it's a hard pill to swallow. So you have to really think about the broader ecosystem and how those features and benefits really can add value. You know, how can you really hit that sweet spot? If it's a Venn diagram, like I said, the humans at the center or those humans at the, you know, there's this desirability aspect at the top. And then these other two circles of technical feasibility and business viability from an overall profitability standpoint, market share dynamics. I mean, all these different things, you have to consider that entire ecosystem, but that's where design thinking is so powerful because you can apply that same methodology. If you have a really great insight about a product or service you want to deliver, you can still integrate these mindsets and methods to bring these cross-functional groups together to solve for those issues. And we've done that time and time and again within Purina to find the way to solve for the end user without disrupting the competitive advantage or some of the you know supply production issues. And yeah. quite frankly, let's be honest, when you do human-centered design right, it drives sales. So at right. the end of the day, sure. you're making money if you do this right because you're delivering you know, it's a not a very novel comment, but you're delivering on what people really want and need, and they're willing to pay more money for those features. Yeah, it's in, in, interesting. I mean, we, we run into the same thing in like space design, which I've been a part of like uh, for a lot of my life. We want to be the ones, once we find out like what works best within a space, we want to be the ones there for the implementation because a lot of times that's where it goes wrong. And, you know, to your point, like into the packaging point or the cracker box, whatever, sometimes, you know, the, the intention and the design was for it to work one way, but to take three cents out per box or two cents out per box, something else was done that, you know, unbeknownst to the whole design process that that changed the whole thing. And I think you have to be cautious about that. And that's why I think to go through the whole process, to understand it and not to, you know, like uh, micromanage or, you know, every single part of it, but just to understand like maybe the first uh, few products that run off the line. I mean, you really got to get a hold of those and understand how they work and is the intent there, I guess. Another question for you is this happens to us all the time, (laughs) but uh, yeah, you get the difficult grocery store CEO, let's say, and you describe like what you're going to do in order to help them out and in order to help. And as you mentioned, to make more money. And they may say to you, well, how does this work for me, though? Isn't that all your thing? And why should I pay more money, let's say, for it, even if it's two cents a box or, or three cents a box or whatever? I mean, why should I make more money for me? Explain what you say to somebody like that. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, the first thing I'll say is, and this is is, you know, I'm just going to give a nod to the, the studies that are out there. But the first thing I'll say is that there's numerous studies dating all the way back to 2014 that have shown that design led companies, you know, you think about people like IBM, Apple, Nike, they are consistently outperforming non design led companies on the S&P mm-hmm. 500 mm-hmm. by upwards of 200 or more percent. And that is a statistical fact. To really bring that home, like I can say that all day long, but I'll give you two examples from my work in pet care where I think that really hits home. Example one is a product and example two is a a more retail. It's actually a grocery example. So the first story I'll tell you um, is about cat litter. (laughs) So I got a chance to work as a design strategist on our Tidy Cats brand, um, which is one of the top performing cat litter brands in the market. And it comes in a variety of packaging formats. This is a great example to exemplify packaging and how this, how you can add value through packaging. It was one of those things where we had an opportunity with a new product form, the actual litter to reimagine the holistic experience. So we we took a human centered design approach and we observed people using cat litter. And if anybody has a cat that's listening out there, you know that there's a lot of pain points with the cat litter experience. It's If you're not using lightweight product, it's heavy, it's hard to clean, it's messy, there's tracking, things like that. There's a lot of different issues with the total cat litter experience. But one of the things that we realized very quickly was just pouring the jug, which only had a top handle at the time, was really difficult on people. We went and observed several households, just people just, we said, go use litter, show us how you use it so we can figure out a way to, you know, help make it better. And very simply, we realized very quickly that it's really difficult for say a mother that's dealing with, you know, laundry on one side of the house and kids running around on the other side of the house to, you know, have to have to manhandle a 20 or 25 pound jug of, of product. So all we did through the design process, taking this kind of ideation and experimentation process was we blow molded a second handle through the side of the jug. So now you had a jug, a handle on the top and a Mm -hmm. handle on the side. That's Mm -hmm. the only thing we changed. The product stayed the same. It was a different fragrance. Uh, That was the only difference. 
the product stayed the same, the fragrance changed, and the the, the handle changed on the side. And yeah. we introduced that to the market, and it was a 20% sales lift for that brand. That was the only feature. And it's because people were, were realizing that it made it easier. I'm going to buy that and not the competitor's product or the cheaper product because that feature makes it easier on me so I don't break my back dumping cat litter into a, a litter box. Did they give it to you like how many you could fit in a box when they ship it now that it has the giant handle? Well, that was the other interesting thing. I talked a little bit earlier about operational efficiency. What was great about this particular project was it ran on our existing equipment. We didn't have to change anything to the, to the packaging manufacturing line in order to deliver that feature. So it was a lot more digestible to the organization to go execute something like that. Sure. And the other thing, the, the other thing that was great was we actually charged more for it so that we had that feature was actually a premium feature that we added to that jug and people still paid it because of the value that it added. So it just goes to show and, and you know, that affects the retailer too, because the retailer who's selling that is yeah. seeing their total category grow. Sure. And so that's, a great example from the product world. I'll give you one more example from the retail world. And this is something that we recently did with a local grocery store here in St. Louis. They, you know, they're again, their revenue minded CEO and leadership team said, Hey, we're, we want to reinvent our pet department to be more consumer friendly. And we want to make it stand out because we know that e-commerce is growing and it's easier for people to just go online or go to pet smart or a pet specialty store. We want people to come into our pet department and make, you know, call it a flagship store. So they gave us a store in St. Louis that we took all of our insights from a category leadership standpoint, what we know, but then we also took a human-centered design approach to understand like, how do we connect with people in a, in a grocery environment? What are they looking for? And through that process, we reinvented their, their pet care department with no new product distribution, meaning we didn't add any new products to the space. We barely added any space improvement in, in, ter in terms of like space expansion. We just reoriented the design of the, the footprint. We made it more open. We added some new fixtures that made it easier to browse things like dog treats and cat treats and things that we know are more impulse-driven purchases. We made the experience better. We integrated lighting. We made it easier to shop. And this was all things that we realized that just shopper experience standpoint was just a gap. You know, you watch people go up, go up and down these bowling alleys of the store and it's just the constant humdrum of shopping. We wanted to make it more of an emotional experience where they can feel like people care about pet because at the end of the day, the emotional connection that people have with their pets is the other reason that I've stayed at a comp this company so long. Like it's an incredibly emotional category. So how do you bring that emotion and the simplicity of shopping that experience um, to a grocery environment? And long story short, that work resulted in a double digit category growth for that retailer. Wow. So while the rest of their store was growing, say at one or 2%, yeah. Pet was growing upwards of 20. It's one of those things where we didn't reinvent the wheel. We just thoughtfully integrated features, benefits, and it more of a spatial design that represented the emotion of pets. So you had different, even visual cues and clues of people, like images of pets with people, really humanizing that, that moment, that emotion. But then we also made it functionally better. And that betterment led to category growth and, and expansion. And th these are the stories that we tell these revenue-minded grocery CEOs that come in say to the retail innovation center to go, this is why you want to partner with Purina because we've got this expertise and we've got this capability that's rooted in your end user, which is your shopper, your customer. And at the end of the day, we should all be customer centric at everything that we do. It couldn't be better timing. We just feel that a study consumers after the pandemic are not going to shop in stores as much as they used to. I mean, to the tune of like 54% when in 2019, it was 26% or something like that. We're doing, you know, strictly online methodology in one way, shape or form or the other. But within that, they said, we're not going to go to stores as often as we, as we used to, but it better be a good experience. And so I think that the onus is really on retailers and especially grocers, because I think grocers have got away with not having a great experience for 120 years. Now, I think they're going to have to, or they're going to really have to buff up the buy online, pick up in store and you know ship to home and all that stuff, which is much more expensive to them. All the category innovation that you might put inside a store 
could go out the window unless they in, install it. Because if that experience is better, it always makes it more interesting to go to the physical store. And it's, you know, when you look back on it, it's really not that hard. You're in that parking lot anyway. It's different than a mall. And so good to hear that. I'm glad you guys are working on it. You also talk about cultural ways of working. What does that mean? What does that uh, elaborate on that, please? I think one misconception I mentioned at the beginning is that human-centered design or design thinking, whatever you want to call it, is all about end products or services. But the the reality is, is that it can be applied internally to help deliver value across business functions. I've worked across, like I mentioned in, in my various roles at Purina, I've worked across areas like co-manufacturing and public relations and e-commerce and even consumer insights to help teams just think better together using some of this methodology. Yeah. I think that's the power of how this discipline drives value is there's an internal external paradigm to it. That's my personal mission. And really what motivates me is this idea of cultural transformation using human-centered design as a key enabler of what I refer to as holistic employee experience or HEX. I'm, I actually just read a book by a guy named Ben Witter, who's the, the global head of the Employee Experience Institute. And he, he wrote a whole book on the idea that, hey, driving a best-in-class employee experience drives better business outcomes. Yep. And they reference design thinking as a key enabler of that. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't be more in line with that, that tenant. Um, yeah. And how do we continue to think about design as a, a key enabler of our cultural strategy and really even bringing things like co-creation to the front of collaborating with our internal associates? How do we co-create with internal teams about what they want and need? How do we use empathy as the guide? Like that wouldn't that, I mean, that would be amazing to me. And is really one of those like personal missions that I'm on. So what's tech's role in this? How does tech fit into everything that, that you mentioned in terms of human-centric design? The easiest way to describe it is it's all about balance. It's easy to get enamored with cutting edge technology, all the bells and whistles, you know, all the different acronyms, you know, AI, VR, MR, AR, you know. Yeah. IOT. I mean, it's easy to get enamored with these things, but it's also really important to consider the role of humans in this world and this, you know, even the pet ecosystem and how they add value. So, I mean, for example, if drones are going to be delivering my pets products in the future, why do I go to the store? You mentioned this, Lee, like wh what's the role of the store? Maybe mm -hmm. the role of the traditional store becomes a place to socially connect with other pet owners or learn from expert pet advisors, which could be the, the employees on how to better care for your pet. I think we're at the precipice of a resurgence of human connection that is necessary in order to drive more holistic value for consumers. I mean, Chewy, I'll give you an example. So Chewy, one of our, one of our top retailers has really tracked, has really cracked this code. They, I mean, on one hand, yeah, they offer a wide variety of pet products at competitive pricing, but the real magic is their customer service representatives who they yeah. empower to help pet owners solve problems. I mean, just again, just go to the Google and Google Chewy customer service stories and you'll get the idea. They're all over the place. One of my favorites is one customer service representative who spent over an hour on the phone with a new cat owner helping her make choices. And that cat owner at the end said she felt like it was taught like talking to a best friend. They sat there and spent time to understand her needs. And that led to a bigger basket in her, a, bit, a bigger e-basket got them to, to sell more stuff to her. Well, I think you're spot on because uh, I, I talked to somebody from Nike one of the things that they were saying was like how important they, they call the their employees, their associates in the stores, they call them athletes. Whether they are not, they're the Nike athletes and they're out there. But they were saying they're so important because they have to know, they have to ask questions and stuff like that. And I've had that experience with those Nike athletes. So I, I asked them and I'm going to ask you the, the same thing. So are employees like the future of physical retail? I think the role of the employee is going to change. I think as, as things like advanced robotics start to be able to provide things like stocking of the shelves and inventory management, even order fulfillment, as you think about, I mean, there's already tests going on with robots that are bringing out like the click and collect order to your trunk. You know, that, that won't be done by a person in the future. But I think the role of that person is going to change. And that's why I think technology, technology with purpose, that's our phrase. Like if it's, we're not just looking at technology for the sake of technology, it has to have a purpose. And if you equip people with the right technology, imagine a store employee that has an iPad or a, a piece of digital technology or something on their smartphone that allows for a pet owner to make a choice about something that's either a proactive or a preventative health opportunity or something that they're reacting to. I've, I've got an issue. 
my pet threw up on the rug. I don't know what to do. A lot of times the associate doesn't know how to ma- help them make that choice. What if technology could enable that? What if we could yeah. create a hybrid approach to where there's this, the human is delivering the value, but it's done it. The engine behind it is the technology that's helping them make that choice. And it allows that consumer to be confident what they're purchasing, what they're doing for their pets. And ultimately at the end of the day, it's enabling a better, a better relationship with them and their pets and their family. There's a lot of talk in design circles, regardless in retail in general about direct to consumer. How are you guys handling that? How is CPG in general handling that? Do you want to be, do you want us to come to you and buy directly and ship or, you know, the, the middleman obviously being super powerful for you guys, like where do you see this all going, this DTC? There's certainly elements of convenience and profitability with D2C models, the direct to consumer model. And honestly, we're actively exploring them as new business model opportunities. But at the end of the day, we value our retailer partnerships. So it's important for us to plug into those and enhance their D2C capabilities as well to make sure that consumers are getting what they want, when they want it, and how they want to get it. I mean, ultimately, they're they're the gateway to the, to the households that buy our brands, and we're not going to overlook that. There's a lot of value there, and we want to continue strengthening our partnerships, which is a lot of what I do to support our generating demand and, and sales teams is helping strengthen that partnership and drive new opportunities to co-create that future together. But the stores are closing so that, you know, that that's a factor. Like your, your middleman's kind of going away. So are you shifting to marketplaces, you know, regardless of who it is, sometimes it's Walmart, sometimes it's Amazon and, you know, everybody kind of picks a blue or a yellow or brand to, to go with. Is that also on the radar? Like to be a fly on a boardroom wall, there's got to be conversations about our main middleman is kind of going away. I don't think I agree with that. I I don't think the middleman is going away. In fact, you see, you know, a lot of our retailers are actually on a growth path, the ones that we're, that we're winning with. So I think the key is the right partnerships and it's, it's doubling down in the efforts that are going to get us to, to drive those partnerships in the right way. Um, and so we just really focus our effort on the retailer ecosystems that are going to give us the most competitive advantage with our brands. You know, we have an incredible portfolio of brands that people really connect with and that reach a lot of households. And as these retailers grow and evolve, I think, I think it's less about retailers are going away and more about retailers are evolving and they're evolving their capabilities, they're evolving their value proposition, they're evolving the role of the store. And we are we want to be in that conversation and use even these capabilities that we're talking about now to bring it full circle to human-centered design. Like use that as a competitive advantage to help them think differently about how to thrive in this future of retail world and what pet care looks like is a key driver of that success. So, and, and, you know, it's going to take an adjustment, I think, on a retailer's part. And that's for the big guys, because I think there's a, a bifurcation in retail right now. I mean, at Walmart, Target, Best Buy, Home Depot, these guys, you know, you're talking about your preferred middlemen, I guess, if, if you would. I mean, physical retail enablers they're going to be fine. They're going to proliferate. And there's a lot of other retailers that I didn't mention that are like that too. But then the the other guys, I think are going to have to learn from what you're saying in order to sort of catch up to them. I don't don't think COVID was a disruptor as much as it was an accelerator. They just got accelerated to like, oh my God, we've got to catch up to Walmart. And with your help, do you think that that's possible? Is that that part of the goal as well? I think that's, that's where we really drive empathy at the core of even our retailer partnerships. Again, you can drive empathy with the end user, but it's about understanding where they're at in their journey. And there, you're right. There are smaller customers that come to us, smaller retailers that come to us and go, I'm not that advanced. I'm yeah. still building an e- a basic e-commerce capability. I'm still, you know, I still look for those, you know, those small, small trips to fulfill, you know, those small trips to fulfill a mission from those shoppers. They're still doing it, but, you know, ha- help me understand that. And so that's why we've got a way of helping them think about their own kind of brand and their own capabilities and still can drive value. So, you know, if we're talking with Walmart one day and we're talking with a regional grocery store the next day, we can still have the same conversation or facilitate the same dialogue, but the, the objectives and the way we frame the problems that they're going after will be drastically different based on the capabilities that they have to deliver on them. But at the end of the day, I will just keep coming back to this statement. It is all rooted in the end user. How do we continue putting the shopper customer 
human, end user, whatever you want to call them, at the center of everything, and then figure out what capabilities you have to drive value for that person. And I think it's really easy to stray away from that because we start talking about distribution goals and driving volume and all these metrics that are more results than strategies. You know, things like market share is not a strategy, that's a result. And you only drive those results, you only drive profitable solutions when you add value. And that value is done in our mind by delivering value to your to the human beings that are integrating with your brand. And so our job is to be there as a, as a key partner in helping shape that future. We were laughing a while ago because we were talking about like the milkman. Little did we realize whatever it was, you know, 50 years ago when the milkman would put something at your door in a little box and pick up the old bottles and they knew you by name and, and all that stuff. We we're sort of heading in that type of direction. Talk about empathy. I mean, the milkman was almost like your neighbor, the postman too, I guess. Yeah. So who do you think's really got it going on right now? Who do you think is really killing it? There's a men's fashion, a D2C men's fashion brand called Bonobos. They're actually owned by Walmart. And I've been a brand loyalist for a number of years to this, to this brand. What's fascinating about this brand is you're talking about an e-commerce built brand, much like Warby Parker that started online, that has now gone to a brick and mortar environment. It's the opposite of what most retailers are doing, which is, you know, you build a brick and mortar experience and then you got to figure out how to deliver e-commerce solutions, whether that's through D2C or buy online, pick up in store. What I love about their brick and mortar experience is, and we actually had a chance to go visit one of their, they call them guide shops. Um, you talk about the Nike athletes, they call their employees guides because they're guiding you to the right uh, products, accessories, things that are right for you. And we asked one of these guides, we went into the store because we were fascinated. They've actually got a, a store in St. Louis and we visited it one day. And, and I asked the one of the guides there, I said, what fill in this phrase for me. People come here blank and leave blank. Cause we were just fascinated. Like why are they like, what do people do in these stores? If you've got this robust e-commerce platform and without batting an eyelid, this gentleman says, people come here empty handed and they leave empty handed. And <laughs> I laughed and, I, and he goes, you know what I mean by that? And I go, no, what? And he says, we basically give people the confidence for every single product that we sell and how it fits them. We help them make the decision about what they then go home and buy through our online sites. He goes, yeah, we can do product transactions here, but what most people do is they leave this store, they go home and they buy twice as much stuff online because they're confident in the fit that they got through the experience that they have here. They get a bottle of water when they walk in. People are spending upwards of an hour in this store and they're not buying anything. I think that's fascinating because I think it puts, again, that person at the center and it's not about driving commerce first. It's about driving confidence. And that confidence leads to the commerce. That's I also just love just the features that they're integrating into their site. So one of their newest features is called MyFit, which is a toggle feature on their site that creates hyper-personalization. It's basically the guide. They've created a guide shop experience through this feature. And it allows mm -hmm. you to pick every single possible measurement that represents you, right? What's your belt size, your shoe size? What fit do you like? What's your jacket size, your inseam? You can answer as much or as little as you want. And when you toggle that master MyFit feature on, it auto aggregates everything on that site to only be the things that they have within those parameters. So it makes the shopping experience completely personalized to your wants and needs. So now I'm not going through going, well, I like that. And then I click it and they go, oh, they only have it in extra large. Well, I'm not an extra large or they only have it in tailored and I want an extra slim fit. Like the hyper personalization is so powerful that it oftentimes makes me buy at least one or two more things than I normally would if I were to go to that site. Yeah, I've been a big fan of theirs for a while. And one of the macro reasons for that, I think that showroom stores like that, which is basically what it is, yeah. are, is retail, physical retail of the future where you can walk in, test the project, you try them on, you can do anything you want, a cup of coffee or like you're saying, a bottle of water or anything you want to. You can talk to your friends in there. You can see what you look like in it. They'll scan it and do whatever they need to do and ship it to your house and you just leave. You can actually experience that type of retail anytime, anywhere on your way to a restaurant. Hey, why don't we just stop in there? I, you know, I could use a new shirt. I don't have to take the shirt with me to the restaurant, you know, like the old days or, or any of that stuff. It's going to show up in a couple of days. It'll be like Christmas when I get my shirt. But I, I thought that Walmart did a really smart thing by buying them because they start to understand the algorithms, including the one that you just mentioned, that's going to allow them 
to have much smaller stores. And, you know, they have basically 4,300 distribution centers around America, which is more than Amazon has right now anyway. So stores turning into fulfillment centers, the front of the stores turning turning into showroom stores seems like a win-win to me. And, you know, with what we were talking about before with physical retail, when you have the wherewithal, like Walmart has the wherewithal to find those things out so far in advance, that's a tremendous competitive advantage. What do you think is going to happen in 21? What's your take on this? What are we going to go through here? Personally, I think 21 is going to stay pretty weird as we try to reestablish whatever normal life um, you know we get back to. But here's here's a couple areas I'm excited to watch play out. One is kind of the lasting effects that this pandemic has left on, again, workplace culture. And I know yeah. this is a little outside of the retail space, but just the idea of like workplace culture and how that's shifting. I know for one, I found a lot of inefficiencies with my eight to five office day that I eliminated through kind of this work from home period. And it made me question ever working a five day week again. And the, I'm just fascinated by the cultural effects and the workplace response to all this. That's going to be just super interesting to watch as we, as we kind of reestablish normality throughout the year. And then this is more of an aspiration, but I'm, I'm really hoping that 2021 is going to recalibrate humanity to focus on the things that matter and reestablish the value of things like empathy, connection, purpose. I know my wife and I found a newfound appreciation for all the extra time we had with our kids being healthy, having solid jobs, just three things that I think is really easy to take for granted day to day. I hope that we hit a little, as a human race, I hope we hit the reset button and just reestablish the value of just those basic principles of, of connection. I'll tell you one thing though, man, 2022 is going to be a huge party. I think so too. I think hopefully we're over the whole thing and maybe unity could actually become a reality by that time. And I, I don't know, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. We have a long way to go. I have to agree with you on the, the work from home thing. I, I, it dawned on me a while ago that, you know, again, COVID was an accelerator where so many things that were already happening. They just happened instead of five and 10 years, they happened in one really fast. But the work from home was the true disruptor. That changed everything. And I think that eventually that's going to, the change the way you and I may do business. And then from physical retail into CPG, we're going to have to come out more so to where the customer is now. Because the customer is ensconced in the city and maybe not, even if they do, they're not as often. The whole workplace culture, to your point, has changed so much. Retail is going to have to shift how we get goods and services and products to people has already started to formulate, but I think it's going to be even different. And even from a physical perspective and also back to employees and things like that, service, for example. So everything I've read about you, I haven't seen you. I I apologize. I didn't get a chance to, to catch you live, but you're a great public speaker. So what's the one thing that you would tell somebody, and I get this a lot too, you know, like I'm just starting to do public speaking. I'm scared. What's the one piece of it that Advice you could give us. Uh, I'm going to keep this pretty brief. It's the same two words I would tell new people leaders. It defines how I lead my team as a leader. It's it's two words. It's be human. Tell an authentic story. Just be real. I think now more than ever, we just need people to stand up and just be authentic, be themselves, be genuine, because that's what the world really needs. And that's what really people are going to remember. I miss the audience though. The, uh, you, know, too, man. you could say something you didn't think was funny and people laugh and you think, okay, I'm going to remember that. <laughs> like what, what, one of my t- techniques, sidebar is, uh, and I learned this at uh, NRF, one of my first NRFs, I, oh my God, there was like 800 people there. And I didn't realize it was going to be that much because a couple of speakers I had seen before that were that smattered of people. But because of the topic I was speaking on, there was 800, 900 people that were all packed on the doors. And I started to get nervous. I went back to my old sports mentality, which is like, I got something for you guys. I got something, you know, so like, yeah, you know, almost a trash talking mentality where you're thinking, I am so going to kick your ass. (laughs) You guys have no idea building up yourself to some sort of unreality, but it, but it always helped me. And I think- Uh I'll tell you what, Lee, uh, that's another reason, another benefit of working in pet care is I'm often reflecting on my own experience and you yeah. show any pictures of puppies or kittens and you immediately get the, yeah. oh, <laughs> and everybody's neutral. There's nobody's <laughs> judging you anymore. They're only looking at cute kittens. They're only looking at, you know, dog, dogs, cats, and babies. It's a win. You just lead with that. You're good to go the rest of the time. So you're off the hook. You show yeah. a little pup, six puppies and they're playing and you're okay. off. Okay. Well, one thing, finally, a, a personal thing. So are you a 
dreaded Redbirds fan? Lifetime Cardinals fan through and through, man. But oh. here, let me let me tell you something though. Uh, I have a tremendous respect for Cub for Cubs fans, and because uh, I I assume I think you're a Cubs fan, aren't you? Yeah, I grew up I grew up not too far from Wrigley Field on the north side of Chicago. Let me tell you just to wrap this up. I want to tell you a story about how I appreciate Cubs fans. So I had my first experience at Wrigley Field was in the bleachers. And it was awesome standing out line, standing in line early to make sure you get your spot. It was great. Sure. And they were playing the Cardinals, obviously. We had just acquired Ryan Fr- Ryan Franklin, who was a pitcher um, on our team. And I remember sitting night, we got primetime location right against the right field wall. And there mm-hmm. were two guys that were, one, we were two rows, one row off the wall. They were right in front of us, just to the left. And these guys had cheat sheets that they had handwritten notes about all of the players on the Cardinals so they could heckle them from the stands. And it wasn't, it wasn't wasn't rude it was intelligent so like Ryan Franklin for instance he went to he went to high school in Spiro Oklahoma so like he would come around like the warning track during practice and they'd go hey Ryan how's everybody doing down in Spiro sure. and like he kind of look up and like you know they're getting a reaction out of these guys I just was like that is a net that is the next level you picture these guys like sitting at home writing all these facts down what are they going to say doing their research you know like it was just so well thought out. Like we had the best time with those guys because they were super nice and everybody was really nice. I, I know that it's a big rivalry, but man, I, I, it's, it, that was a great experience. And I just had a newfound respect for, for Cubs fans after that. Well, day. it's so funny you mentioned that because all my life I've talked about, my sense of humor was developed in the left field bleachers and what we used to call intelligent heckling. And so everybody would bring something about so this guy's girlfriend or something <laughs> like that. But everybody there is a baseball fan. So somebody behind me would go like, oh, he shouldn't have thrown that. What did he throw that curveball for? You know, you have a conversation like next time he's got to come inside with that. You're having this conversation with all these people around you like baseball, which is not true anywhere else in the stadium. You know, it's families and it's people going to see a ball game and casual fans. But in the bleachers, I mean, there's true baseball fans out there. And and it's so funny you said that intelligent heckling because that's that's been my mantra to my kids, like intelligent heckling. They're like, what's that? It's for you, you know, you don't know. Hey man, I'm 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 sure we share this sentiment too, but that's the other thing about 21 that I'm excited for is I'm I'm ready to get back into the baseball stadium. Even if it's 20% capacity, man, there's nothing, there's nothing like Chicago and St. Louis baseball to your point. I, so I agree. It's a beautiful thing. You just have to sort of understand. It's like the chess of sports, really. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. You've been very gracious. Very much appreciated. Thanks. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Great discussion. Thanks for making WDCast better. Totally appreciate it. Good luck and good luck to all of us at 21. So people be sure and listen to WDCast as we prod more valuable information out of extremely interesting guests like, like Stephen. Also, be sure to subscribe to this podcast, which is at WD.com. Go to the podcast icon on the bottom of the page in the Permanav. CEOs, entrepreneurs, human-centered designers, artists, retailers, all good learning. Thanks for listening, everybody. Stay safe. And remember the first rule of leadership that it's always your fault. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen.